that's, that's totally excellent. You know, like we want to explore Kubernetes with you, James. <laughs> so that's what this talk is about, exploring Kubernetes and, you know, just really kind of getting an understanding. Again, I know there are a lot of people, um, you know, especially with more Java background, um, you know, more typical uh, legacy stack, but I get it, you know, everybody's exploring and wants to learn more about what else is going on. People want to see what other kind of technology advancements are out there. And, you know, so that's what this is about, you know, um, just trying to understand the technology. I think if you also come from a background where you have worked, you know, in um, something like Java or Java Spring or even PHP, you know, um, and you've worked a lot with servers, maybe a lot of this like new tech, newer technology may actually be easier for you to pick up because it's not as complicated. And so, um, you know, that's also kind of a nice benefit if you're trying to start up, you know, um, new servers and, you know, you're trying to start up um, some automation processes. Uh, this is really kind of like the next level, this is the next direction to go in. So I think um, Docker and Kubernetes are a little bit code agnostic. So you can kind of use whatever flavor of language you really like. And I think it's uh, it's a good way to just you know try out something new, even if you want to use like an older language or you want to like play around with the newer languages like JavaScript. Tim, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, much throughout the talk, but nothing in particular. Uh, I guess uh, short source. I'm getting a lot of uh, like relatively new to Kubernetes is in the chat. Is anyone here like uh, fairly experienced with Kubernetes and wants to volunteer themselves to uh, also jump in if there are questions? Um, totally fine if not, but just. Me the sense. Cool, hearing none. Um, should we get started? I'm good to go ahead and yeah, get going. Yeah, uh, if, before we get started, let's make sure we um, uh, yes. do a little farmer's spiel and then we can get going. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Vijay, for hosting this. Uh, and I see 20 participants, which is great. So, myself, I would like to introduce myself, Vaibhav Shah. And I've been with Farmers for like about two years, and uh, you know it's really it's really going good. Uh, what I you know we are from myself and Prakash, and I think he will introduce himself shortly. We are from the Farmers.com, Farmers mobile app. You now we manage the customer experience from the IT side, uh, and I specifically focus on the mobile apps. And uh, other than Farmers mobile app, we also have other mobile apps that we manage, Bristol West mobile app, Foremost mobile app, which are kind of like customer facing. And then our tech stack, uh, you know, it's, it looks like Heroku, Node.js, Java, Angular, iOS, Android, you know, all the traditional uh, stack. And, you know, as a company, we are always, we may not have the latest and greatest in terms of tech stack, but we, as a company, we are always exploring newer technologies, right? And, and we do have a huge appetite you know, to explore and then see which ones, which ones is the next best thing. So that's why I think, uh, you know, meetups like these are very important for, you know, for us to just see, you know, who, who it is in the community, you know, and what, what, you know, what, what are people mostly interested in. And, you know, just from a farmers.com, uh, you know, company perspective, right. You know, we have been doing really good. We are always looking for, uh, you know, people like you uh, to join our team. You know, we have been the best financial customer service, according to Kiplinger. Uh, you know, great place to work. 89% of our employees say it's a great place to work. You know, and the bottom line is people feel at home, you know. So, you know, look look at go to farmers.com slash careers, see, you know, what you, you know, under technology, see what the careers are, job job openings are, and then uh, feel free to reach out to me directly uh, uh, and or Prakash. And I'll probably give it to Prakash uh, to chime in as well. Hey, Prakash. Yeah, just a couple of things to add to what Viva said, right? Uh, we are an insurance company, but more of a technology company. Uh, the, especially our departments are focusing a lot in the engineering culture and also uh, the CICD pipelines has been discussed for long, but we have been doing it for long as well. A uh, lot of technology focus, um, as you said, uh, very, very uh, kind of a technology company where we are looking for a lot of uh, good talents uh free to reach out to us directly or through um, through our hr but uh, we love to see good talents coming in flowing to us uh, good luck with this uh thanks james uh, for uh, doing this and uh, thanks vijay for organizing this and uh, i'm very eager to learn about this and 
I'm new to Kubernetes. Uh, I'm primarily managing the overall team, but I, I love to learn about it as well. Um, good luck, move forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Farmers, for uh, sponsoring the group. And we um, always love to have you here and check out our meetups. I'm going to now hand it over to James. Feel free to start. Sounds good. Thanks, y'all. Um, let me figure out how to share screen here. No. Uh, can I get access to screen share? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. I should have done that right away. OK, so you are co-host. You can now share. There we go. OK, cool. Uh, is that showing up for everybody? Yep. Um, not the speaker notes version, the like regular version. And can you all see the source code over here? Yeah. Yep. Cool, cool. Sounds good. Um, I may not be able to see the chat or y'all's faces while this is going so much. So um, if there is something that pops up in the chat, y'all want to uh, feel, feel free to unmute and just hop in if there are questions. Um, yeah. Not, real quick, I'll just say like uh, etiquette, please keep yourself muted. And um, you know, when the speaker is talking, if you have a question, you can do it in the chat. Um, we'll collectively um, ask questions to James, like whenever James is ready to take questions. Um, so you can take questions anytime you like, or you can wait till the end and then we'll do a QA. and a Yeah, I'm, I'm super happy to take questions throughout. Yeah, y'all right. feel free to throw stuff in as it, as it comes up. Um, so yeah, we're here today to explore Kubernetes. Uh, quick outline on this. That is not clicking through. Excellent. There we go. Um, all right, so our outline for today, we're gonna do some quick background, just kind of overview here. Um, primarily, we're going to be looking at a couple tools. Uh, we're going to look into exploring a Kubernetes cluster using Lens. We're going to look at iterating on a Kubernetes cluster using Scaffold and defining components with CD Kates, and then do some kind of summary takeaway questions here. Um, ask questions along the way, happy to adjust, but that's the, the rough game plan. A um, little bit of background first on me. Uh, I, I uh, have been described very accurately as an application developer who is kind of stumbling down the infrastructure gradient. Um, so, uh, you know, it was not that long ago, uh, that I started dabbling with, with some like chef Ansible sorts of, uh, options for defining infrastructure. Um, I historically have found them very frustrating. Uh, if you've ever worked with any of those sorts of systems, they are similarly kind of declare the way you want your computers to be set up and some magic runs and 30 minutes later, maybe it worked or maybe it didn't. Uh, I always found it really hard to get a good kind of feedback loop going. And, and kind of because of that, stayed away from, from DevOps work for a long time. Um, it's kind of interesting because now I work on the imp application infrastructure team at Procore, along with one of my coworkers, Kim, who is here today. Um, what we do is to develop dev-facing abstractions on our inf internal platform to kind of help our developers self-serve infrastructure, um, hopefully with kind of like minimal cognitive overhead. Uh, it, it's a weird spot for me to be, but I, I do want to kind of share with you the things that I have found that have helped me work in this space and not pull my hair out. Um, alternate title for this talk was, was how I learned to stop worrying and love infrastructure development. Um, and I will say it is, yes, about tools, but also it is about techniques. I, I hope that there is some content in here that is helpful for you as you learn <laughs> anything. Um, doesn't have to be Kubernetes specific. Um, but that said, like, let's talk a little bit about Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes, if you have not heard of it before, uh, it's going to be a lot to digest super quickly. Uh, but it is a container orchestration platform out of Google. Um, what that means is you package up your code in some you know, Docker containers, and you tell Kubernetes to run it, and it will run it for you. Um, one of the major design decisions here is that everything that you interact with is defined in terms of structured YAML. So if you want to understand what's going on with your Kubernetes cluster, you're ultimately gonna be reading some YAML or talking to a tool that reads some YAML. And similarly, you'll be writing some YAML to kind of configure anything. Um, Kubernetes is a big deal right now. I have absolutely no statistics to back that up, but would have to assume that some non-trivial fraction of all of the world's compute power is sitting on top of Kubernetes somewhere, probably. Uh, citation even, but. Um, if you've never seen Kubernetes before, this is roughly what it looks like. Um, this is a kind of simple Kubernetes application. 
uh, a Kubernetes application is made up of a whole bunch of different resources that have kinds that Kubernetes understands. So here you can see a deployment. The way I would read this is there's a deployment named Nginx. Um, it is saying that there should be two copies of a thing running at all times. The way you tell kind of if the thing is running is by looking for stuff that's labeled Nginx. And if you need to go create new ones, do that by creating new things labeled Nginx. When you create them, they should run one container. It contains uh, this Nginx version Docker image and kind of exposes port 80 on the container. Uh, this thing over here is a service. Um, this is your way of telling Kubernetes like, hey, I've got a lot of you know, nodes in my cluster. I've got some workloads running somewhere. I would like for um, uh, I'd like for you to put a network interface um, in the cluster, um, and kind of expose port 80 and route it over, uh, sorry, expose port 300 and route it over to port 80 on the deployment with label app Nginx. Um, I will say like, uh, this is a talk more about the Kubernetes tooling ecosystem than the specifics of Kubernetes. We're not gonna dive super deep on all of the various parts of these definitions. I mostly mentioned this to give you a sense of, you know, what does a Kubernetes application look like at the end of the day? Um, any questions here uh, before we go farther? Sorry, let me, it's gonna be obnoxious, but I hate having my speaker notes up because I can't see the chat. So I'm gonna do it this way. Um, there we go, this is better. There'll be a border here, but I think we can live with that. Um, any like super high level questions here or? I know this is new. So you got one question. Um, why is it called Kubernetes? Ah, there we go. That is an excellent question. And I should have prepped that. Um, it, I, I, isn't Kubernetes like the Greek god of shipping or some Greek mythology character or something like that? I see a nod. Um, I could be wrong. That might be true. It's a Greek name. It's a some sort of clever reference. Um, I will, the, it, there is something like that because a lot of the Kubernetes ecosystem tools are named after like shipping things. There's like Helm and Spinnaker and uh, no, Spinnaker's not Kubernetes specifically, but um, there are lots of like boat puns. Anyways, um, so for this talk today, we're gonna be looking at our own Kubernetes application. I can kind of show you that here. How's the font size? Does that look okay? Greek for helmsman. Kubernetes is Greek for helmsman. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, okay, so uh, today in this talk, we're going to be iterating on a particular Kubernetes application that I have running on a local Kubernetes cluster on my machine. Um, you definitely can spin up the remote ones, but one of the things I found, like if you're exploring a new, new environment, um, it is super helpful to have a quick feedback loop. And, and part of that is kind of being able to run things locally and poke at them. So that's a lot of what we're going to look at today. Um, uh, my goal for this session, time permitting and, and, and y'all's interest determining, um, is to try to update this app with a like relatively straightforward change. Um, I'll describe a little bit more what this is doing, but, but you can kind of look at it here, right? Like we've got, we're running a stateful database that's running uh, you know, a Postgres image. It's got uh, kind of itself exposed on port 5432. I've got this deployment running some sort of um, image named meetings, which is pretty uh, opaque, uh, but you know, got a health check. It's got some environment variables pointing it at a database URL. There's a cron job that at nine o'clock every day is posting a curl command to some kind of service running inside the cluster and, and some odds and ends. Um, our goal for today is going to be to update this application. Um, kind of, we'll we'll do a simple like add a health check to one of the services that's running in it, sort of sort of deal. Um, we're not going to look too much at the application code, but just to kind of give you some context here, th this application is managing meetings, and it's got some like interactions with uh, Google Calendar API, Slack API. Um, there's 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 four Nest JS services running. Um, one of them listens on a Kafka topic. Uh, one of them has a Prisma database. They're slightly different, but they're all like broadly pretty similar Nest services. Um, oh, sorry, I got a question in the chat. What is required to set up a Kubernetes cluster on a local machine? Excellent question. There are lots of options out here. I don't have a de facto best one. Minikube is real popular. Kind's real popular. I'm just running 
Docker desktop. Docker for Mac has a like built-in Kubernetes cluster. There are a number of options. Um, they all seem to work pretty well. Uh, but Minikube is definitely one of the more popular ones, and it's pretty fully featured. Um, so yes, we have a contrived application here. It's kind of four Nest microservices. We can dig into the specifics, but they probably aren't super relevant. Um, but our goal is we've got this meeting service that has a nice, nice uh, health check running. Are people familiar with the concept of health checks? That's maybe something I should mention briefly. Um, it's, a, it's a general topic. It's, a, it's an endpoint that you can hit to say like, hey, service, are you healthy? Uh, Kubernetes has some specific notions of both liveness and readiness, which are ways for you to ask your application both like, are you healthy? Uh, in particular, like does Kubernetes need to restart this application because it's gotten in a bad state somehow? And also separately, are you ready to receive traffic? Um, so, uh, you know, think about a service that needs to boot up and talk to a database that it depends on. It is perfectly possible for it to come up and be live but not yet ready to receive traffic because it hasn't established a connection to the database. So uh, Kubernetes has slightly different notions for, for liveness and readiness. Uh, how often should you do health checks? Totally depends, um, right? Like if, if you do them very infrequently, there's less load on your application, but also it'll take a longer time for it, it, Kubernetes to realize that something is in a bad state and fix it, you know, kind of depends. Um, so cool, we'll leave that a little bit more as we go on, but uh, that's that's roughly the plan. Um, what I really wanna to talk through today is, uh, I think y'all are all pretty new to this world. You've just been barraged with a ton of information and a brand new ecosystem and asked to solve a task. Uh, welcome, this is what it feels like working in Kubernetes sometimes. Um, I wanna kind of give you some like tools and wayposts and ways of thinking about this that help, uh, you know, kind of take your first steps into this ecosystem if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, so the first one I'm gonna look at here is Lens. Uh, Lens is freely downloadable. It describes itself as uh, an IDE for Kubernetes. Um, I'm a big fan of it. it. It gives you a good GUI, right? Like I think y'all saw, if you kind of look at this YAML file, it is real easy to kind of miss the forest for the trees and, and not get a great sense of what's going on here. I'll say even this example is pretty pared back. There's a lot of, um, like I don't have any resource limits set on anything. I don't have any security controls set on anything that you really should have in a production application. So if you're looking at like your production Kubernetes manifests, they get pretty uh, dry is not the word. They repeat themselves a lot. Um, they get a little hard to read. Lens is really helpful because it lets you kind of poke around, right? I, I've thrown a bunch of words at you that are probably unfamiliar to you, but even just kind of clicking through the UI, you can start to get a sense of like, oh, Kubernetes has some concepts around networking, like ingresses and services, and you maybe can explore them a little bit. Um, you can see if you click through, uh, right, like we saw in that YAML manifest, a cron job. Here it is, it's running on my cluster. Uh, it runs at nine every day. If I want, I could trigger a job right now. Um, I also can edit it live. You'll notice that Kubernetes has a lot of like managed fields that it adds that you should just learn to look past. Um, but if I wanted, I could, you know, live update this to say, you know, runs at 10 every day, save it, close it, send it to Kubernetes, and now the cluster will run that job at 10 and every day. Um, probably not a great idea to live edit your, uh, definitions here where they're not checked into source code in a real production application, but for exploration's sake, it, you know, really helpful to be able to make a small change kind of immediately see what it does. Um, So yeah, like I mentioned, uh, my Kubernetes application is running. Uh, you can kind of see here, here, here are my four services. It's running four separate deployments. If I want to kind of understand the meetings deployment a little bit better, uh, here's some details about its resource usage over time, um, some information, you know, it's running one pod. I'm going to try not to explain what a pod is other than just kind of a collection of containers uh, for now. Um, we can get into that if it matters. Um, Right, but if you drill down, you can kind of see, um, oh, sorry. So uh, kind of looking at this pod, uh, right? There's one meetings container. It's got that environment variable that's pointing at its database. Um, some really helpful things that Lens gives you here. If you ever want to understand better what's going on, um, you can kind of drill down 
is lens essentially the same as Kubernetes dashboard? If that, I don't, is Kubernetes dashboard a particular product? I'm not familiar with it, if so. It's a, you know, graphical user interface for Kubernetes. Um, so that's the same thing. Um, but yeah, it gives you an easy way to like pull up the logs for a container that's running. Um, you can see, you know, I'm making requests to my health check endpoint and this meeting controller all the time. Here's some of the like, it booted up, nest, boot up, normal messages. Um, you also can open a shell on a running container and poke around all you like. Uh, that is a super useful debugging tool at times. Um, And, and yeah, you can you can live edit the definitions. Although again, that's not normally something you want to lean on because that is not something you do in, in prod. Um, yeah. Uh, any like high level questions here about lens? So you have a or, few, yeah you have a few questions um, going on in the chat and I just wanted to make sure that maybe we got some feedback. Um, so basically I think like um, kind of starting from above around like 622 um, or 623, like uh, maybe if you wanna just kind of explain like at a high level, what is the relationship from Docker to Kubernetes or Kubernetes to Docker? Like how, like I think some people might be confused about like um, what Docker is and then like how Kubernetes is kind of like a bigger version of Docker. Totally then, fair. So, yeah. yeah, 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 that makes sense. Um, yeah, I should say, right? Like I, I kind of have to make a wild guess at what people here are familiar with and I, I'm sure I'm wrong. So I appreciate the feedback nudging me anyway. Um, right, uh, Docker, if you're not familiar with it, um, kind of quick crash. Well, let's maybe do it this way. Um, if you want to understand, right? Like, uh, nah, no, that's a little opaque. Uh, I'll mention here, um, right? E each of these services, these are nest services that I have written, all right? They, they're application code that kind of exists in this repo. Um, and so like somewhere in the process, we've got, we'll see this in, in a second in some, in some detail, um, but somewhere in the process, we've got something that takes my like application code. Like if you're interested in the Slack app, uh, if you're interested in the minutes app, that's probably the best one. Um, it's a pretty lightweight Nest application. The sort of, um, if you've seen Nest.js, uh, this, is, this is a normal kind of entry point here. Yeah, um, just some context, sorry, sorry to cut you off. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, just, so if anybody's um, kind of wondering what Nest is to Nest is kind of, like maybe you could talk about that as well. Like Nest, like is like a, yeah. Like a higher level of express. That's what I've heard. And I've heard some people talk a lot about it. So maybe just kind of, um, you know, talk briefly about Nest to like how it's easy to spin up a quick app with Nest. And yeah, know. totally fair. Uh, I this, like a Nest tutorial is out of scope, uh, but I will say uh, you're exactly right. Like uh, Nest is a backend uh, TypeScript, JavaScript framework for writing um, kind of microservice backends. Um, it's got good support for like uh, swapping out HTTP or Kafka, like whatever your kind of transport layer is, which is one of the things I like about it. Um, but yeah, you can think of it as a higher level express. It literally runs on top of express in the default configuration and just kind of gives you some more opinionated ways of structuring your app, breaking it down into modules, defining controllers that may look familiar to you um, uh, coming from like a Railsy or Spring sort of world. Um, you define a lot of your routing with annotations that again may look somewhat familiar to you. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's doing work very similar to Express and, and ultimately kind of serving up um, you know, some, some data uh, on a, in this case, uh, right, like a get request to the root will return the get hello message, which uh, kind of makes a request on out to Confluence for, for this one. You, you can see that. Um, Here's me uh, making a request directly to the minutes service running in my cluster. Now, oh, come on, uh, look close. Sorry. Right. Um, so that that is being served up from Express running or yeah, from Nest running on my Kubernetes cluster. 
Um, does that, I mean, that's super short on Nest. Yeah, yeah. But, that, but that's, that's perfect. Really that's, that's perfect. I mean, like, um, and I guess like just kind of like going from there to, you know, how yeah, on, on the, Docker and the Docker front. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so if I want to run this code on a machine that's not mine, I have to get it there. Um, and uh, a very common way to do that is uh, kind of baking it into an image. Um, yeah, and I'm not a uh, container versus image. Um, high level. Uh, the idea here is we're just going to kind of take a snapshot of a like virtual machine sort of thing. Um, Docker gives us a way to kind of declaratively do that. Um, I've got my Docker files over here, right? So uh, if you want to look at how do I build the container that's going to run my like Nest Prisma example, well, there's a distributed like third party supported node 16 Docker image somewhere out there. So like, cool, I'm going to pull it down. I'll start from that as a base. It's got all my like node tools that I need available to me. Uh, and then I've got some declarations that say, here are the layers I'm going to add on top of that to kind of define what's in my, my container image. Um, right, so install some libssl dev stuff, uh, copy the package.json file and lock file from my local machine into the container image, uh, mount an NPM credential that lets me download private uh, packages and, and run an NPM install. If you're familiar with Prisma, it does like a Prisma generate step that does some code gen and then kind of like copies all of my app code into the container. So at that point, I have like a frozen image that's got all of my like application code, like a snapshot of that. Um, and then it runs like npm run start dev, which is Nest's kind of default start up an app server, watch files for changes, and you know, serve up content on, uh, on, on port 3000 sort of uh, thing. So uh, we'll see in a minute. I've got some, some tooling that helps me um, kind of bake these Docker images uh, and, and through some magic, get them onto my Kubernetes cluster so that when you've got something that says, you know, like I've got a deployment running um, schedule, that that is really running an image of the, the code that's in the schedule folder. Um, Docker is its own whole world with a lot of uh, complexity and we could dive in pretty deep here. It's not a spot where I'm a super expert either, um, but does that kind of help give folks a grounding? Any any other questions there? Yeah, and so maybe the audience, like if, you, if anybody wants to just check in, just go ahead and say, otherwise we can keep going. Yeah, and so- so I can chime you, in. Oh. So, so do you need Kubernetes? to run a Docker uh, container or can you run it without that? Yeah, no, uh, you, you can just, like if you have a Docker container, you can just straight away run it. Just like Docker run is the thing that works fine. Um, you like, if all you have is a single process that you need to run, that's great. Um, there are plenty of other tools that help you kind of coordinate. Uh, you know, I've, I've got an app that's made up of, um, you know, multiple different images from multiple different sources. I want to run them all. and kind of help them talk to each other in the way that they need to and all that stuff. Uh, Docker Compose is a, is a really popular one. Um, I will say like Kubernetes is largely interesting for like platform operators, right? Like if you ever run anything on Google's cloud, whether you interacted with it or not, it is probably running on top of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, it, it may be running on top of abstractions that people wrote on top of it. Um, I, I've never worked at Google, so I don't actually know if the internals there, but, but you know, my, my, my supposition is, um, you know, when, when you're working at that scale and you've got you know, a, a massive fleet of nodes and a massive number of containers and you need to figure out how to run them all safely without, you know, cascading failures, taking down some other one and with all of those sorts of like uh, enterprise grade platform concerns, Kubernetes is a good tool for that. Um, may, may not be something you need for, for you know, I, I just want to run the process on my machine sorts of use cases for sure. And before you continue with Lens, I was just wondering, could you could you restate exactly what Lens is? I was asking if it was comparable to Kubernetes dashboard, which is just an add-on for Kubernetes. And uh, when you enable it, it allows you to view all of your running deployments or containers, whatever term you want to use. So yeah. Um, sounds similar. I haven't used that in enough detail to really know uh, differentiating features. I, I will say like the, the key things that I'm looking for in something like that is that it gives me a way to like 
qu query the cluster and see what's running and kind of explore it in, in a reasonable way. Kind of poke at, you know, what's the underlying YAML definition, get the logs for my processes that are running if I need to, and kind of get a shell on a, on a container if, if I need to. Like the, those are the things that I use kind of day in, day out. And, and I guess like see, you know, if there are events or errors or something's unhealthy, I want to be able to like quickly drill into what's going wrong and why. Um, I'm sure there are other tools out there that help you do that kind of stuff. Uh, this, this lens is the one that I use. If people have a different one that they like better for some reason, I would be super interested to hear that. But that, that's that's largely what I'm looking for there. Um, let's see, and then other questions. Um, can you use Vim key bindings and lens? No, you cannot. Or at least not without some add-on that I'm not aware of, which is a bummer. Um, cool. Uh, I guess I didn't say anything about namespaces. I probably should say that Kubernetes apps can be deployed into a namespace, which gives you some isolation and, and an easy mode of like, I, I like that when I'm developing because I kind of deploy into a dev namespace and you just trash the whole thing when you're done. Um, we can talk about specifics of any of these. One of the really cool things is it is extensible. So while like pods and deployments and ingresses and network policies are all things that kind of Kubernetes supports out of the box, there are ways for third parties to define their own resources with their own kind of semantics supporting them. Um, so I've also got like a Kafka cluster deployed on Kubernetes uh, using a, a, a Kubernetes operator from, from a third party vendor. Um, so, you know, you, you can kind of poke around with those just as well, right? If you wanna know what Kafka's are running in all namespaces, like, oh, here's a Kafka cluster. You know, what, what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. That's a cert, that's private. Um, I don't know if we'll make too much mention that today, but it uh, can be helpful. Um, anything else folks want to see on Lens or shall we move on and look at making some changes to the application, see how that process, we'll, we'll be back in Lens to kind of poke at them a little bit. But. Yeah, let's keep going. Cool. All right, so um, I think I probably already Sorry, uh, I think I probably already said all of these, but kind of key takeaways there, right? Like having some kind of tool like this is really just kind of key for discoverability if you're exploring a, a new space and, and really helpful for debugging. Um, the next tool I want to look at is Scaffold, right? Um, I, I have a, let's go back, um, right? I've got some pods running in my application's namespace and I've got a YAML file that is, you know, the thing that defined them, but you know, how did they get there? Um, the kind of key bit here and the thing that I use all the time is, is scaffold. Uh, the way this works is you run scaffold dev uh, and you can kind of see it go, um, right? There are uh, some directories it knows to watch. It watches them for file changes and it, it uh, deploys out all of the Kubernetes kind of resources that you define in your manifest. Um, we'll see that again, so don't worry that it cleared. Once the deploy rolls out, um, it will pipe you the logs from all the things that you just deployed. And so you can see, oh, cool, I've got a bunch of nest services spinning up. I'm seeing my normal kind of log entries. I'm seeing kind of what containers they're coming from. Uh, that all seems to be proceeding well. If I go over to Lens, I can kind of see that. Um, and then kind of over time, you can start to see, uh, I'm getting like a health check in the meetings container. Um, my scaffold definitions, uh, the way scaffold, uh, scaffold is configured with a just kind of scaffold YAML file in your project. Uh, this is the thing that it looks at to understand kind of what application code do I need to watch for changes? How do I need to build those changes? And what do I need to do to deploy them? Um, so the way to read this is um, whenever stuff changes, we'll look at that in a second. Uh, deploy to the namespace Friday, all of the Kubernetes resources defined in this YAML file. So this is the one we've been looking at. All right, so anytime something changes here, um, you know, it, it would deploy to the cluster. Um, what's an easy way to see that? 
Um, here's a not great way to see that. Uh, I'm going to change, here's the health check path for my uh, meetings appointment. I'm going to change that to making requests to the root instead of health. You'll see scaffold kind of picked up, um, you know, no changes to my containers, but a new manifest. So it kind of rolls out of deployment. Um, stuff's going to boot back up and you can now see my health check requests are going to the root. Uh, I'm going to revert that real quick. The probably more interesting part for now is this other section about the build. So the way to read this is um, I'm telling Scaffold that in this project, I've got a, a, a couple of artifacts. Uh, these are Docker images that, that I want built and me kind of injected into my Kubernetes manifests. So uh, this says kind of any time in your manifests where, where I'm saying, hey, Kubernetes go deploy meetings, Scaffold's going to intercept that and instead kind of deploy a meetings image that it builds. So that, like, if you've never worked with this kind of stuff before, often when you're building a Docker image, the workflow can be this like, uh, you know, push your code changes up to CD, CD runs, runs the tests, builds Docker image, pushes it up some Docker image registry, and then and only then can you like pull it down and run it. And that can take 30 minutes or an hour. Um, it can be kind of painful. Scaffold's really nice because it just kind of hops in and lets you do it all locally, right? It's just an immediate push to your cluster. And, and, and moreover, has some tools for watching the files for changes and skipping even the whole Docker image build and just immediately just like syncing those files over into the running container. Um, so we can kind of see that, right? Like, uh, again, I've got some network ingress set up. Um, so if I make a request to meetings.localhost, that gets routed to the meetings app controller. Um, so here's, here's that content. If I change the app code, uh, right? Scaffold will notice, so that went fast. Uh, scaffold will notice that one file has changed, uh, ship it into the running container, at which point Nest does a hot module reload and starts back up and I can make a curl and see the updates, uh, right? And that's a real, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a quick loop, right? If I kind of back that back out and curl it again, uh, there is, <laughs> I, I have only one replica, so it's not like one has to shut down before one spins up, um, but you know, within a few seconds, your, your app code is live and running in your, in your local cluster. Um, Again, one of the things that most frustrated me when I started looking at infrastructure stuff earlier on in my career was just how hard it was to get feedback that the things that I'm changing are working. And I found it so much more effective to get some sort of setup where you can make your change and get a real fast feedback loop of like, yeah, that worked or no, that didn't and here's why. It helps you stay in the sort of flow that you may be used to from like application development and like a good, test suite doing a nice TDD refactor, like whatever it is that, that does that for you, right? I, I, I have found these sorts of tools a helpful way to try to reclaim some of that in the infrastructure space. Um, uh, again, our kind of uh, conceit here, our, our, our goal is to add a health check endpoint. Um, I should point out that like my meetings local host, I can hit the health endpoint and I get an okay. My minutes, I cannot. The way that works for meetings, um, there's an app module that just sort of says, yeah, there's some platform concern that gives this to me. I just have to opt into it. So what I'm going to do here is in my minutes app module, minutes, I'm going to add the same thing. At which point scaffold should see that file change, kind of sync it out to minutes. And once that comes back up, I can curl my new health check endpoint and get the, yeah, everything's, everything's good. So that's the app layer change that I need to make here. Um, but you kind of get the idea, like there's a, there's a nice quick feedback loop on you know, whatever kind of app layer changes you need to make. Um, any questions here? Happy to, I'm, I'm totally happy to take questions on me. I know uh, I breezed past some of the Nest stuff. We can talk about that more if people are interested. Um, Any questions so far? 
I just want to make sure. I think there might be some in the chat. Uh, I've lost the chat. Where's the chat? Uh, we have, what is the alternative to scaffold? Yeah, good question. There are other tools out here. Um, oh man, I've already forgotten the other one. Tilt. Uh, yes, Tilt is another pretty popular one in the space. There may be others. But like one, uh, Kubernetes is definitely an ecosystem where like it, it's new and there's a lot of interesting, exciting stuff and there's a lot of people in the space. And so I think that the story with a lot of these is there's often not a one clear best tool for any particular thing. Um, there, there very well may be others that I'm not aware of, but I, I think Scaffold and Tilt are the big ones that I'm aware of for the sort of like uh, local dev loop, watch for app changes, sing them to your cluster real fast sort of, sort of thing. I, I should mention, um, yeah, I have some slides. I should go back to the slides. Um, right, we talked about this, right? The, the, our app dev loop is we make the change, Scaffold syncs those files immediately to the container, Webpack picks them up, and you see your changes running real quick. Um, we didn't see this. We can look at this. Uh, that's great for app code changes. That's that's less good for like library code changes. If I want to like bump a dependency, uh, let's see that. Um, if I want to, let's say, like in my meetings services package JSON, if I want to bump to the new version of Nest, right? Just make a, a version change to a dependency. Um, Scaffold still handles that. It will notice it changed, but notice that the meetings kind of the the files that got baked into the meetings image have changed, and so it needs to rebuild. Um, no, nope, it didn't because I tried that locally earlier today, and it's cached. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> if I make a change that's not cached, uh, Scaffold will do the appropriate thing and say, like, oh, I've got to rebuild the Docker image. This is what a Docker build looks like. Um, and it's cool, right? Like, you still do get the, like, make your change. It automatically runs and, and will be running on your cluster as soon as possible. It is definitely slow. This will take, like, a minute um, to do with the full reinstall and build the image and everything. Um, so if, if the thing that you're iterating on is some like library level code and you constantly want to be checking it out with a consumer, this is maybe not the best setup. Um, but you know, like meta point here, it's more about how you use the tools than, than the tools themselves, right? Like I have set up Scaffold in a way that is good for app dev. Um, Scaffold does support kind of defining different profiles where you could you know, use a totally different Docker image build where you're syncing like, you're syncing both the app and library code and like linking them together. Like you, you have options here. Um, the thing that I really want to encourage you to do, like even if you never look at Kubernetes, right, is look at the things that you do a million times day to day and think about the feedback loop that you're getting and think about, you know, is there anything that I could do to get feedback more frequently and have the computer help me um, learn, you know, more, more new things per day. Um, super helpful when you're exploring a new ecosystem, but I think just valuable for anything you do. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there are some other provisions here. You don't have to do in a dev loop. You can literally use Scaffold as your kind of like continuous deploy tool and just you know, run it. I, I, like when, when you shut down Scaffold, it will kind of delete all the deployments, clean your cluster back up, but you can do a Scaffold run, which there just pushes it, makes it running. Uh, a few other things there that are helpful. I'm just going to leave the dev loop running. Uh, oh, yeah, here you can see lens. These are the containers shutting down. And new ones coming up. And new ones becoming healthy. And the old ones being deleted entirely now that the new ones are up. It's kind of fun to watch deployments roll out sometimes, especially when we have lots of full pods. So um, I got a question for you, actually. Yeah. Yeah, this is nice. Like I, I'm seeing those containers come up and um, I just, I guess maybe like if you go back a little bit, right? So you are essentially using Kubernetes um, in a way where you're making changes, um, you know, locally to your, your computer. And then, you know, like you're doing the hot module reloading and basically you're reloading your app, but are you also rebuilding your your cluster set at the same time. And that's why this is turning green here. And does that mean, you know, that this is going to um, already be deployed elsewhere, like to your end, I mean, like to other places um, outside of your computer, or is it just within 
the Kubernetes set that is on your computer, and then you can push that all together when you're done elsewhere. Yeah, I'm kind of I, I I'm somewhat deliberately not talking about like the world off of my computer because it's totally different, you know, place to place, right? Like um, maybe you have a uh, like Amazon managed Kubernetes cluster, Google managed Kubernetes cluster, or something that you can just kind of take this and push it straight to. Um, uh, maybe you have some different CD process where you work, wherein like you you bake an image and it gets bundled up some other way. There's like there's a, a lot of different ways that that could look. Um, you can, like assuming you have access from your local machine to your production Kubernetes cluster, you can just you know, scaffold run deploy to my production cluster and use the same kind of tool chain, test out locally, deploy the exact same thing to prod. Um, I, I don't personally have that. Our, our production clusters are you know, access controlled in a way that that's not really viable. So that's not a thing that I do day in, day out, but that is, you, know, you could imagine that working at some, uh, but essentially, you're still you're building this cluster set, like while you're doing local development, and then later on, you know, does that? Yeah. So usually, what this looks like for me is um, <laughs> we're, we're kind of working on this. Actually, we'll do the next little bit here, and that'll make a little more sense. Um, what what this looks like for me, though, right? Like I'm I'm iterating on app code, and I'm going to ship that like I normally would, right? Like you, you push that up to to a GitHub repository. Um, this is not entirely true, but you can kind of imagine uh, along with my app code, if I checked in this, the full kind of generated Kubernetes manifest, and then had some process kind of pick that up, verify it, make sure it had the right security you know, resource limit settings and whatnot. Um, and then that trusted system could kind of you know, push these definitions out to my, my running production cluster, like in the namespace that I own, something sort of like that. Um, is that, can I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, uh, no, I was just like trying to, you know, in my mind, like kind of compare this to like your normal Git, you know, push CI CD flow and then, you know, something like, I don't know, Travis or GitHub Actions like goes and yeah. you know, does all your code, then basically like you, you know, use something like harness or whatever to like send a deploy. Yeah, so actually, well, and, and, and maybe I should clarify, um, the lens stuff we've seen, the kind of scaffold stuff we looked at, um, all at the end of the day wraps a, a built in with Kubernetes uh, cube cuddle command that lets you do all of this stuff. Uh, you can kind of cube cuddle apply a YAML file. Um, really, like that's all scaffold is doing is it's using cube cuddle to apply the YAML file that's generated in a namespace. Um, and so, yeah, like you, you could just Again, assuming access is all squared away, you could just have GitHub Actions do a cube cuddle apply the YAML file that it generates. Um, yeah, OK. I see. I understand what you're talking about. With that deploy, like YAML's uh, line there, you're using cube cuddle. OK. Mm -hmm. and then yeah, this, this is, I think, literally doing a uh, cube cuddle apply namespace. Uh, from the file, packages info.yaml every time that file changes. Um, gotcha. All right. Yeah, that's all I got. Um, you can keep going if you want. Cool. <laughs> so the last bit here then is um, we've looked at how to make app changes and kind of iterate on them quickly in our local environment. Uh, the question I want to ask is like, okay, if you want to change some of your actual like, Kubernetes manifest, uh, cool. Like, how do you do that? Um, we mentioned it earlier. Uh, it's kind of painful uh, reading this, and this is at the end of the day a pretty simple Kubernetes uh, application. Um, and so you can imagine, like maintaining this whole thing over time would be, would be a little hard. Um, so I want to talk about CDKates, which is a tool that I really like here um, for kind of defining your your Kubernetes YAML. Um, Again, our motivating goal here was to add a health check. And I think we should, like the, the health check endpoint is functional. Uh, right, um, but if you notice my Kubernetes cluster is constantly pinging my meeting service and asking like, hey, are you still healthy? Are you still healthy? It will restart it if it's ever not. Um, it is not constantly pinging and asking my minute service that, that is, uh, and, and the change that I want to make here is to introduce that health check. Um, 
you can kind of see the, the Kubernetes, the, the like YAML that I need to write, right? Here's my meetings deployment. It's got a liveness probe. Um, if I go down to my minutes deployment, I can add a liveness probe and that will work and, and be very unsatisfying. Um, right, you can imagine, right? If your company has 50, 100, 500 services, you are not gonna manually copy and paste around changes, right? If you have platform conventions you wanna evolve over time, you know, like security policies you wanna be in place, whatever, um, you need some better tool than people that are gonna hand manage and reconcile YAML files. Um, so what I wanna look at here is how this YAML actually got generated. Um, and that is by using uh, CDKs. Uh, sorry, I didn't comment on that. I should have. Uh, if you'll notice when it was running for a minute, we were getting um, health check calls to the minutes uh, service. So I think as long as we can get this in our YAML, we're, we're good. Um, so yeah, I want to take a closer look here. Uh, and, and sorry, I should have said at the outset, I'm going to share all this code when we're done. Feel free to poke around with it, ask questions uh, after the fact. Um, if you take a look in the infra package, I've got... Um, uh, this is a CD Kates definition. CD Kates is uh, again, a library out of Amazon, a uh, cloud development kit for Kubernetes. Um, it is some tools that let you write TypeScript uh, with all the niceties that normally entails, right? Um, and have the TypeScript run and generate your YAML manifests. I'm a huge fan of this because like we as software engineers uh, have spent years figuring out all of the tools for encapsulation and information hiding and code reuse and code deployment and testing and all of those sorts of things. Um, and using something like this lets you apply all of those same techniques that you're used to to infrastructure definitions, right? Like, again, in past lives with infrastructure stuff, the second you get it working, you don't touch it because it might break something and you have no confidence in it. Um, the nice thing about this world is you're writing JavaScript that spits out some JSON, right? Like that is so something that we should be able to unit test well and talk about the inputs and the outputs um, and, 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 and be really confident in, in what we're producing here. I also really like that it lets you kind of abstract out and tell stories and, and kind of expose the code to people in the way that they you know, are, are, are thinking of it, right? So um, that YAML manifest is really hard to read, but this reads like I told it to y'all, all human beings. You know, There are four services in this chart if you were interested in drilling down in those details, you definitely can. Here's the Slack deployment. It's it's pretty simple. There is a deployment, it's named Slack, and it's got some two containers. Um, the meetings deployment is somewhat more involved. Um, right, it's got a cron job that's running, it's got a database running. Uh, it also has a separate deployment for the, um, just kind of the nest service. Um, again, the thing that I really like about this is you can just test it, right? Like my, my, my meetings chart is a JavaScript class uh, and I can write unit tests about it just like I would unit test anything. Here, here are my tests about it. Um, you know, they say that with the default options, if I synthesize the chart into some YAML, it's got a liveness probe, it's got a job schedule, if I synth it and I explicitly pass in a particular schedule, you know, that's the schedule that I get. Um, and, and moreover, one of the things I found really helpful here is having some like snapshot testing. Are you all familiar with snapshot testing? Um, yeah. It's just, you know, test run to test run, take a snapshot of what it looks like. It, that's really helpful for if you're doing like a refactor that shouldn't be changing the output, you get real quick and easy verification. Like, yeah, you didn't really use a bug by doing this. Um, so super handy. What, uh, what I'm going to do here is, uh, right, like, again, um, the, the change that I'm asking for, we can make, right? The, the um, here's the spot where I'm defining uh, the, the liveness probe for the meetings container. If I go over and then I look at the minutes um, chart, you know, I've got a deployment. I can paste that line in. I'll need to import the probe class. Uh, but if I do that, and then I've got a, a little helper script here. Um, 
So what this does is it watches changes to this TypeScript code, compiles it, runs it, and produces new YAML. When that happens, you can see Scaffold kind of pick up that new YAML and deploy it out to my Kubernetes cluster. Um, right, so again, you get pretty fast feedback about the changes you're making to your infrastructure definitions. And, and there we can see, right, like, cool, uh, Kubernetes is now hitting the, the controller endpoint. And again, good enough functional, like those were the requirements, we met them. But I think, uh, and, you know, us, us here as software engineers, uh, copying code out of one place and pasting it into another one feels just viscerally bad, even if it is one line. Um, right, and, and the thing that I like here is we don't have to do that. Like we have some sense for how to do that uh, better here. And that's to kind of abstract out, um, right? What, what I would actually do in this world is, uh, let me start running some tests. Um, I'm gonna kill scaffold for a little bit while I'm iterating on the tests, right? But I, I've got some snapshot tests here. And you can see I broke the snapshot tests because uh, you know I added a liveness probe that's not reflecting the snapshots. Let me comment that out for a second. Um, right, cool, yeah, not using probe. You're correct. Um, right, but I can do just a nice normal like incremental refactor here. Um, rather than copying and pasting this around, what I'm observing is there is a common notion, right? The, these both kind of have some conventions about what a nest service ought to look like. So I'm going to extract out a class for that. Call it nest service. Um, construct is sort of the CD Kate space, like a Kubernetes resource thing. Uh, And let me kind of introduce it in so it's not unused. Right, that should be a totally safe refactor and the unit tests prove it out. No, they don't. Um, oh, right, naming thing. Um, that's an implementation detail, it's not super interesting. Let me skip that for a second. Right, but what I can start doing is saying like, cool, th this is stuff that I kind of want to repeat in all of my services. So let me lift that up into here. Um, and let me let the compiler help me, right? Um, the compiler is complaining because there's a meetings deployment now that it doesn't know about. Well, all of this is stuff that's kind of common there too. Let me lift that up. Right, uh, kind of anytime I'm making a nest service, I want a deployment with a container and a service exposing it and some local ingress. So cool, like that, that seems like a bundle of functionality that's relevant. Um, my compiler is still mad at me, or I guess my editor hinter, right? Um, it looks like this needs to know about a DB port, but that's not something that it does, right? DB port's a local variable to find up here. Um, you know, thinking about this a little bit, right? Like, uh, I, I don't know, it's not that every nest service is going to have a DB URL environment variable, right? Like that, that's something that needs to be flexible across services. So different services can define different environment variables. This is ultimately something that I wanna pass in. Um, so I want N to be uh, like, well, I guess what was it? Yeah, this, this is the other thing that is huge for me. If you've ever written any kind of Kubernetes stuff, you're writing raw YAML, good luck, hope you get it right. Um, here you're writing TypeScript, which means you have a compiler checking you and you have kind of in-editor hints and auto-completing. Um, it's a really nice kind of editing experience. Um, so, where was I? Yeah, uh, and this, sorry. Uh, I wanna lift out this variable uh, that is a container props. And sorry. There we go. Um, 
And so I want to lift that out and pass it in. Right, and that should be a safe refactor, which we can check with our unit tests. Um, nope, what did we miss? Oh, that's somewhat obnoxious. <laughs> it never did this before. Uh, this is a reordering. Right, we have the cron job. Oh, 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 wait. Huh. Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, there are ways that you can force CDKs to render the resources in a specific order if that is relevant to you. I don't remember them offhand and me going and looking up the documentation for it. it's not going to be interesting. That is the thing that we can do if we care about. I'm going to eyeball this and say, this is fine. This is the same cron job here and here. I don't care about it getting reordered. So I'm willing to update my snapshot and say that change was safe. The other thing that uh, changed here is the deployment labels. Which again is just kind of the way that Kubernetes matches up stuff. Uh, this is something that that um, Pilot CDKs manage internally. I don't care that that changed. That is also a thing that I'm fine with. So I'm just going to say you to update snapshots and go like, cool, that was a safe step. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. The test is now failing in the one where it tries to um, ah, sorry it's okay I mean like you know I, I think it's cool that you're you're kind of showing us like the testing and I think um, you know like you're doing the service maybe just like if you want like if if you want to you know Make sure it works. <laughs> that's fine. But if you can't, then maybe just kind of give us like a higher level. Like no, that's cool. Uh, the, I, the, I figured out my mistake. Uh, I needed to be passing in this as the parent scope. Uh, that that should fix the snapshot back to what we had initially. Um, yeah, and the test. Um, Yeah, I, I'm happy to carry on with this mechanical part. Uh, if y'all want to skip that, that's totally fine too. The the to kind of finish this all out, what we would need to do, right, is um, well, we want to extract a nest service. Let me just pull it out to a new file. Um, that's all well and good, but it does kind of hard code that it can only make the meeting service. But that's fine. Like we could lift that to a parameter. At which point, um, this nest service is something we could reuse, right? So if we instead kind of drop the nest service into the minutes chart, give it the updated name. Um, we we in a state where our services are now kind of generated from one shared definition. They kind of stay in sync, they're maintainable in the same way that you know any, any kind of dried up well well factored code is. And we can you know make the change easy and then make the easy change, right? Once we get it to using one one spot, we can introduce the liveness probe there and everything works consistently. I'm happy to do that mechanically if people are interested. I'm also just happy to you know, talk through other uh, anything else people want to see here. We're also about in an hour, so uh, really, like I will, I will gladly defer to y'all. Um, whatever y'all are interested in chatting about. Yeah, feel free to ask any questions here if you have any. If nobody does, I'm going to finish the refactor because I just have a mechanic like. Uh, a need to, uh, but I'm I'm happy to chat while I do that. Um, it's it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I just want to open it up. If anybody has questions for us? Maybe a more general thing that some people might like hearing is like maybe explaining why are we using YAML to configure things? What's the benefit of having these sorts of things? Just in general, I know that lives outside of Kubernetes, but maybe for some newcomers that might. 
Yeah, um, I mean, there's a there's a little like chicken and egg thing here, right? Like I'm 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 taking for granted that people are interested in Kubernetes, and, and Kubernetes has kind of chosen that this is how it works. Um, I will say like what well, and, and 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 for what it's worth, um, you can write JSON instead of YAML. Uh, Kubernetes knows how to serialize either of them. Basically, everything you'll see is written in YAML, but you know whatever. At the end of the day, it's it's syntax. Um, the thing that like the reason I think they made that decision and why I think it's a good one um, is that is that sort of um, it's declarative, right? Like you, you um, if the code that you're writing talks about the change to make and and you write your code by making change, making change, making change, making you know, like deploy this package, install this thing, change this configuration. Um, for you to reason about the system, you have to understand its current state and every operation that's been applied ever. Uh, a declarative model is one where you just kind of say, like, here's what I want it to look like. Kubernetes, go work out the detail. And in a way, it's kind of like the move from imperative programming to like a functional programming sort of style where you're just saying, like, here are the facts and some other system is going to figure out, like, oh, if I've asked for five replicas and I only have one replica, I need to scale up. Um, declarative systems like that where you describe like data about the thing are much easier to reason about they're also much easier to build good tooling on top of right like uh, there's a well-defined structure to everything that's running and so you can like there's this common op interoperability layer where you know the third like party ecosystem can build tools on top of that and build custom resources that can build things like lens that kind of query the apis um so yeah not on the kubernetes team don't know why they made the decisions they made uh but i they seem to make sense to me for, for, for supporting those sorts of things. Yep. Yeah, and just a lot of tooling uses YAML in the infrastructure world in general. So it's kind of just like what a lot of people are using and um, I think a lot of the infrastructure world is trying to catch up with the programming world on a lot of tooling and like committing things as code, you know? Yep. Um, and, and seriously, like this is part of why I'm so excited about things like CDK8. Is, is it really does feel like it 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 straddles that line well of of you know uh, a lot of the infrastructure code that I have looked at and worked on over time uh, it was you know hacked out by somebody. It worked one time, and you hope it never breaks. Um, like we we as software engineers have worked pretty hard to get to the point where we are comfortable in like thinking about how code gets promoted up to broad and gets tested along the way and verified incrementally with larger and larger integrations and everything. And this feels like a good step in that direction for, for infrastructure code. Sorry, I think I cut you off there. Yeah. No, 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 that was, that was it. Some people, I, you know, maybe everyone already knows that, but I thought, uh, it's worth bringing up because I think it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's seriously, like um, I, I feel like the infrastructure as code idea has been out there for a while, but uh, it it uh, it seems still surprisingly uncommon for people to think about taking their infrastructure as code and like drying it up and and kind of engineering it in the same way uh, that you think about your your kind of application code. And I don't, there's no reason you shouldn't, uh, in my in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. Anyone else have questions? Just want to make sure everyone has a chance to ask. That's part of the appeal of this group. We can also carry on. I think like if you have, you know, um, uh, anything else that you want to like end with James, uh, we can go on. Yeah. Um... I'm happy to hang out after. Honestly, this is just going to be me replacing meetings with a name variable and then dropping the nest service chart in here and passing in minutes as the name. And it should just work. I, I, again, I'll, I'll share out this code when it's done. Uh, so y'all y'all can, uh, I'll finish up that commit, share out the code and you can look at the commit when it's done. Um, but yeah. uh, that's maybe not super interesting. No, um, I think this is really interesting. So I was going to ask you if you could provide um, a link to the Git. Yeah, yeah, definitely will do. Um, just kind of wrapping stuff up then, I guess, um, right? Like it, it, when you're working on this sort of like infrastructure layer, you, you have a similar dev loop, right? You make your change. Uh, you got to let CD Kates kind of rebuild the YAML and then scaffold picks it up from there like normal. The deploy, it totally depends how long the deploy takes on like what sort of change you make, right? Like if your deploy spins up a new Kafka cluster, like, yeah, it's going to take several minutes to happen. But, you know, for the most part, you get you know, pretty good fast feedback on the infrastructure changes you're making. 
Um, and like we said, the the things that I'm really excited about there are you get the autocomplete, the hinting, the unit testing, the like everything that you've come to enjoy about programming in TypeScript, you get it when you're working in this world. Um, which, and and I, I cannot stress enough, like having a compiler and and uh, inline documentation as you're writing the stuff, especially when you're new to it and don't really have a feel for the options that are available to you, super valuable, highly recommended. Um, I'll also mention, I don't know if this group cares, but CDKs does have parallel implementations in Python and Java. Um, and there is also a CDKTF that lets you write Terraform using a similar sort of uh, you know, declarative programming language style. Um, again, we kind of talked through those tools today, but uh, what I want to leave you all with is, um, you know, like, Put some time into thinking about your tools, uh, right? Like if you're, especially if you're learning a new ecosystem, tools which kind of give you good feedback, give you some discoverability, help you explore are immensely valuable. Um, and whatever you're doing, new to language or not, um, spend some time thinking about the feedback loops that you go through every day and, and what you can do to make them faster, more enjoyable, right? Like if you get feedback regularly, you are learning more. And also, you know, if you can get it real quick, you're, you're staying in a state of flow in a way that is uh really rewarding and 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 ultimately i think uh, it helps helps you grow um also i'll say the process of like thinking through what does it take to get a good feedback loop kind of forces you to think about the tools in a different way that, that also i think can help you kind of um explore them differently and, and learn some stuff I, I i learned more about docker uh trying to set up things like this than i uh, had otherwise been exposed to and, and, you know it, some friction along the way but it pays off in the long run um yeah, that's it. That's it for me. Uh, again, happy to take questions, happy to hang out with whatever. But um, that's uh, that's what I had for y'all today. Cool. Uh, thank you, James, for the great presentation. Um, it was fun to watch you code as well and see unit tests in real time. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, I wanted to just uh, you know, again, give everybody here a chance to ask a question. So you know, I'll try to make it so that. Um, we have at least a few minutes for that. Um, in the meantime, if you're listening um, and forming your question in your mind, you may also want to uh, share your LinkedIn, you know, um, in this chat, if you want to network with anybody, um, that goes for everybody here. Um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you like. I'll drop in my LinkedIn afterwards on the chat. And uh, you can also reach out to me on Discord. I'm on the uh, HackBuddy Discord and I can share a link for that right now. Um, also, the other thing is that, uh, you know, much like farmers um, mentioned earlier that they're looking for people. Um, I just wanted to also mention that, you know, if you're somebody who is a little bit newer and you're still like learning to code and you wanna get better at it and you wanna eventually work for, you know, um, a big company or a big corporation, you're welcome to join this uh, open source team that I have called Team Hack. It's uh, teamhack.org. It's a place, um, it's totally free. There's no charge or anything like that. Uh, basically what it is, is just, um, I've dropped a link in the chat. If you wanna take a look at it, it's a place where you can just practice a lot of the skills that you hear about um, at these meetups. And you can pair a program with people like myself and you know, some of the other developers. So feel free to sign up for that and check it out. Um, and as always, there's always going to be meetups at our websites, javascriptla.net, and also at hackbuddy.com. Uh, I'll drop a link for that as well. And you probably will find us through meetup.com or through YouTube or um, Instagram, wherever your favorite social media is, because we'll be posting there as well. But, you know, please continue to come to these meetups, um, ask us questions, and you know, let us know what you're really interested in because we want to make sure we're dialed into you and want to make sure that you know we understand what it is that you're looking to get better at how we can help you get better as a coder and make this group all around much better so again thank you everybody and hope you uh, if you have questions feel free to ask now i do uh, if, if i may I, I want to emphasize here like if you are new to this stuff and you just heard like a million things that are totally overwhelming and unfamiliar to you like don't panic uh i, I was there not too long ago um but... Kim, who is on my team, is new to all this stuff too and has been picking it up. Uh, and maybe can speak to that if he's interested. Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, but yeah, like it, it's 
you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? Um, really the most important thing is to like find good projects that engage you and keep you learning uh, and, and finding a good community of people to work on them with. So like really cool to see stuff like uh, like the team hack stuff. Um, encourage all Plus one, to two, good community and good mentor. I think that makes it fun. It makes it easy if you have people to work on it with, definitely. How long would you say it took you to become comfortable with learning K-8s? Uh, that presupposes. <laughs> Um, uh, no, I like, uh, I, I'm, I'm learning new stuff about it every day. Um, I, Kim's on my team. Uh, she, she, she can attest to that. Like we, we are figuring stuff out all the time. Um, it is one of the amazing and horrible things about this industry is I don't know that I've ever feel like I've, I've ever really mastered anything. Uh, you just kind of keep getting better day by day I'm doing that. It's fine. Um, I, I will say hey, like, a couple I, yeah, uh, that's probably the better answer. Um, I, I do think that like uh, it, it was, I'm presenting this stuff because I think it was a key part of my learning. I think my, my initial exposures to Kubernetes like felt much like my initial exposures to other tools I've used in the past, but that was more about the way I had it configured and the tools that I was using and the way I was using them. It was still very like black box. I couldn't see what was going on. I made a change and hoped for the best and 30 minutes later, I found that it didn't work. Um, I, part of why I want to present the stuff is because I believe that if you work through things this way, uh, it can help you feel comfortable much more quickly. That, that's my hope. I saw I didn't answer earlier. There was a question about like what's the difference between CD Kates and uh, Helm, which is an excellent question. Um, Helm is the probably more popular established tool in this space for like how do you kind of parameterize your your YAML stuff. Um, Helm is written in Go, and the way you interact with it is you write um, YAML files with like Go template language built on top of them. Um, so the, uh, the the reason uh, openly we're using Helm at work, and I am trying to encourage us to move to CDKs for more stuff. Um, you kind of miss out on all of the editor hinting. You're writing a like munged YAML file, so you don't don't get the sort of like type checking stuff. Um, it's often kind of unclear how to parameterize and share things. It's doable. Um, it, that, that is definitely like the standard tool in this space. But I, I find the like this sort of workflow, this sort of um, developer abstractions, much much more powerful and compelling to me. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so thank you, everybody. Um, I think, uh, you know, if no one else has any more questions, we can always follow up with James afterwards. And, you know, we can send him your questions there. I know some people sometimes like need some time to kind of digest everything and think about what was said. So if you ever feel like you want to watch this again, we are going to post this video at youtube.com slash hackbuddyorg. And I'll put a link for that also in the chat. Uh, feel free to um, subscribe to us there. There are a lot of videos that we have been putting um, pretty much like on the regular. And so uh, feel free to go and check it out there if there are things that you want us to, you know, talk about in the videos as well. Uh, as far as tutorials, you know, if you want like a more in-depth tutorial, we can do that for you. You know, I can do that for you. I can make a video um, on basics you know, things like Docker or Kubernetes, um, and we can help you out that way. You can also just message me on Discord, especially if you have feedback. But yeah, you know, um, whenever we have the experts, you know, we want to make sure that we can, you know, um, get them all the right kind of questions. So just feel free to uh, reach out to me as your point person, and then I'll be happy to get from Sal to James, and um, he can reply back. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, if there are no other questions, then uh, have a great night.